it's my experience that most scientists do have intellectual curiosity, but sometimes there is a long lag period between our curiosity accomplishes something of value to society. I will just give you an example. Every day, at least on my video screen, I receive from one to five new ideas as to how to protect people from COVID-19. Do I know that these many ideas that show up on my screen and the various town hall meetings we have almost every day at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center, will they protect you in the audience, myself, Dr. Shulka, or anybody else? And the answer is, we don't know. So one of the parallels that I can give you to prepare you for where we stand with nanochemistry percutaneous penetration today would be something that happened some many decades ago when a chemist at a paper company that chopped down trees and made paper, Crown Zellerbach, published that DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, went through the skin and could be tasted. That in the 1960s was a true revelation. And what did it do? Well, it led to dozens of patents. It led to more than a hundred requests just to the American Food and Drug Administration to develop drugs based on the delivery of dimethyl sulfoxide. Now that was the 1960s. This is 19, this is 2020. How many drugs do you know that utilize in man, in Homo sapiens, dimethyl sulfoxide? Well, if you work in pharmacology, you know there are very few such drugs and their utilization in man is limited. So the big picture is with nanochemistry is that research, whether it's funded or not, is an area of both knowledge and fashion. Some of you wear ties, some of you wear jackets, some of you wear informal clothing. That is your style. So a generation ago, the style was nanochemistry. In the state of California, there were so many companies and laboratories a whole generation ago working in the area that we were asked to present in theory, because we had no data, the amount of penetration into the body so that some of the scientists in the California state government who were involved in toxicology could inform their public, namely the people working with nanochemicals that might in the laboratory spill on the skin or be used for therapeutic purposes. That was a very long time ago. So you would have hoped that by today, wherever you are, that we would know all of the answers. Well, the answer is we don't, but I'm gonna share with you the single most uh, valuable experiment that we are available, aware of. 
But first, you need to know a little bit more about your skin than maybe you learned about as medical students, because the skin was the same then as it is now, but the knowledge has increased. As you know, your skin is surrounded by one of the most remarkable membranes in all of nature. Your stratum corneum, which is now shedding cells onto your computer and into your room, is approximately 15 micra thick. That is what protects you from chemical exposure. That is what inhibits your use of nanochemistry for skin therapy or systemic drug therapy that has to get into and through that thin, remarkable membrane. If you haven't said hello to your stratum corneum recently, you probably should because it's keeping you alive. Without the stratum corneum or a severely damaged stratum corneum, if you don't receive remarkable intensive medical care in a very well advanced medical facility, you will probably be deceased in seven to 14 days. How do we know that? Well, there are some accidents of nature in which you lose the stratum corneum and we know how many people die when these accidents of nature occur. The one that you might, if, if you went to medical school, remember is toxic epidermal necrolysis, which remains an ever-present clinical problem today. But when your stratum corneum is intact, it's a wonderfully effective membrane. Now, how do we study? What are the techniques? What are the tools that allow us to identify what gets into the body through the stratum corneum? Well, those of you who are in research know today we like to depend upon our computer. Namely, go to your computer and do an in silico evaluation. Unfortunately, there is too little percutaneous penetration data with any nanochemical to begin to do that. So a second technique would be to do old fashioned modeling the way we did before we all had our computers. But again, it's the same problem. It's not gonna solve any of your questions about percutaneous penetration of nanochemicals because we don't have enough biologic data, enough quality penetration data to begin to do that. Well then, the next thing you could do is you could apply any nanochemical that you're interested in for pharmacologic purposes or toxicologic purposes to an animal. The most convenient animal would be the rabbit. You probably wouldn't use that because it's very much more permeable, its stratum corneum, its skin, than your stratum corneum and skin. You'd probably go either to the rhesus monkey or you would go instead to um, the miniature pig. Again, a little bit of that work has been done and has not yielded as much information as we would like for reasons that I'll go into a minute, in a minute. Then you could go to man in vivo which is a little bit cumbersome with the various committees that are necessary. But no matter what you do in vivo, in an animal or man, you confront another 
toolbox or technical issue, and that is analytic chemistry. So now we're going to go back to dimethyl sulfoxide in the 1960s for background. Why is it that in the 1960s, people were amazed and fascinated that the dimethyl sulfoxide went into the skin? Well, we have the explanation. It was at that time, the chemistry of the early 19 and mid 1960s didn't allow us to determine what went into the body and was excreted. Namely, when the chemical, when the dimethyl sulfoxide went into the skin and then had this, was absorbed into the blood vessels and had this large volume of distribution, because remember, you're three quarters water, so it gets distributed in the water, and then you could measure it in plasma, in serum, in urine, in feces, in sweat, in skin, or breath. But the chemistry of that time always, or almost always, gave us a false negative answer. Namely, we were below what is called today the LOD and LOQ, the limit of detection and the limit of quantification. So that is the reason that people were so surprised because they had too much negative information because we didn't have the tools at the time. We had clinical hints that chemicals went into the body and that people died of poisoning from skin, but it wasn't an advanced, rigorous science. So what do we have today? What is the tool that we can use that is the easiest to deal with? Well, that is to take human skin ex vivo. The skin comes either from plastic surgery, usually it is usually discarded, or skin from volunteer donors uh, through the various ethical committees. There is reasonably adequate supply of this skin to study percutaneous penetration of nanochemicals as a surrogate into your skin. We have learned a great deal about how to do it. We won't go into all the details because at the end we'll tell you how to reach me if you need any of these details. But the one thing that in vitro percutaneous penetration, either with human skin or with pig skin is often used as a substitute, miniature pig skin, which has some similarities, there is one major limitation. So for those of you who read your daily newspapers, you've probably observed in February, March, April, and even today, frequent notes from journalists about what was believed to be a shocking story about your use of sunscreens. Namely, in February of this year, our colleagues at the Food and Drug Administration had performed and published and gave interviews about percutaneous penetration of sunscreens used in the United States. They didn't look at all of the sunscreens, but some of the common ones. And their conclusion, which shocked the journalists, some healthcare workers, some physicians, were twofold. Number one, that using a rule of thumb called a level of concern, namely, if you absorb more into your body, into your blood, above that level, that the toxicologists of the FDA suggested we really ought to know a great deal 
about their effect on your heart, your lung, your brain, your kidneys, your liver, your ovaries, if you have them in testes. Well, what they found out that in some of the commonly used sunscreens, they were above the level of concern, and that is now leading to a major reevaluation of our almost lifetime use of sunscreens, and will probably change our use of them in the next number of years, depending upon how rapidly the data is gathered. So the one thing that in vitro percutaneous penetration doesn't answer, which they hint at, but we know a little bit about, is once the nanochemical gets into your body, how readily can you excrete it? Is this clinically relevant? Well, yes, it is clinically relevant. If any of the audience is above the age of hex, the use of hexachlorophene, for instance, in the 1960s, there were at least 20,000 cosmetic products alone using hexachlorophene. And only when we killed babies in France did we realize that the problem with hexachlorophene is not that it was a high penetrant, but that it was not readily excreted. So we've known since the 60s, since the analytic chemistry permitted it, mainly the use of radioisotopes, that almost every chemical that has reasonable low molecular weight, meaning the usual number is given 500 Daltons, but we have dermatologic drugs that are effective at over 800 Daltons. And if the chemical has reasonable lipid solubility, reasonable water solubility, and a reasonably low melting point, it's probably going to get in the body. So if it gets into the body, you want to know, is it like hexachlorophene? Is it going to lead to central nervous system seizures and death? Or is it readily excreted? That we have no information for any of the nanochemicals. So now that leads me to the one experiment that I believe we have some degree of scientific credibility. And now I'll explain how the experiment is done. It is in vitro percutaneous penetration through excised human skin from the donors that I just mentioned. This skin is available in many hospitals, many clinics, and from commercial sources. The first part of the experiment is to show that the skin is functioning normally. Now, the skin probably has hundreds of functions, but the one that we in science have been most fascinated with in the recent two generations is water transfer, because the stratum corneum does hold water into your body remarkably well. So the standard screening assay is simply to see that the in vitro skin that you use is transferring water at normal levels, which are now well established. These studies are not done with damaged skin, unless one particularly, which is another part of the percutaneous penetration story, want to study its effect on damaged skin, but that is not the substance of today. Many of the limited publications so far in the area have not dealt with a chemistry with a specifically low LOD, a low number, 
meaning limited detection and a low number for a limit of quantification. So we were fortunate with some wonderful collaborators and I will give you the reference now. The journal is Toxicologic Research and Application, Volume 3, Page 1, last year, 2019. So with the help of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the United States, the, a major government radioisotope lab, we were able to obtain reasonably hot, meaning a high specific activity so we could find it easily with liquid scintillation counting. The following material, iron oxides and silica oxides. But those were difficult to deal with when one is doing uh, the type of liquid scintillation counting that is most efficient, namely carbon-14, a weak beta emitter. So what was done, they, the laboratory chemically grafted on something that we could track, which would give us a highly efficient level of quantification and detection, namely a COO or carbonyl groups. So we then studied various sized nanos. I will refer you to the article if you'd like to know the clever ways today in which one can quantify the various physical chemical attributes of a nanochemical. And I will then give you one only other reference, a recent one, but in a small textbook, the senior editor is Cornier, C-O-R-N-I-E-R. -E the name of the small textbook is Nano Cosmetics, Nano Cosmetics, but it would occur, it would be utilized for any area of chemistry in, in, for both pharmacology and toxicology and gives you the high level of science that we now have for the physical chemical characterization. So we applied this material to in vitro human skin that, that allowed normal water loss. We felt it was normal skin. And we utilized some extremely small nano chemicals namely as little as 12 nanometers up to some four and four and a half times as large. Um, now you need to know the next part of the in vitro human skin penetration assay. You apply the chemical to it. In this case, it was applied in an aqueous solution. We allowed it to stay for various time periods up to 24 hours. The skin can be kept reasonably intact by the use of antibiotics for the 24 hour period. And then one, during the 24 hours or whatever time period you're studying, you have the opportunity to collect what goes through to what would be the mimic of your blood supply. So if you could imagine in front of you now a cup of coffee, on top of the cup of coffee was an aqueous solution of a nano um, iron oxide and silica oxide carefully labeled. And then over various time periods for up to conveniently 24 hours, you'd go to the bottom of the coffee cup where there is a simulant to your blood flowing through it. So this is known as a flow through diffusion system, a little bit complex, but very useful. And so we were able to determine 
with these various sized nano, uh, both iron oxides and silica oxides, did anything get into the simulant for your blood? Was there anything in the bottom of your coffee cup that got through? And the answer was, even with the wonderfully precise and um, very informative liquid scintillation counting, nothing could be determined. Did that mean that one or two molecules didn't get through? Of course not, it's not that sensitive. By the way, there are more sensitive techniques than liquid scintillation counting that could have been used. Now, where was it? Well, the overwhelming amount was on the surface of the stratum corneum or in the stratum corneum. Well, how do we know that? Well, at the end of the eight hour or 24 hour period, whatever time period you want to study, we simply wash the surface of the skin and that's compartment number one. Then we separate the stratum corneum from the epidermis, that's compartment number two. And then we separate the epidermis from the dermis, that's compartment number three. And the fourth compartment is the reservoir on the bottom of your in vitro coffee cup, the reservoir simulating your blood. So with the various size iron and silica oxides, only the smallest one went into the epidermis. And as I mentioned, that was approximately 12 nanometers. Well, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that number one, for those people who are interested in toxicology, it is very likely that the physical chemistry, at least of these two nanos, suggests that there will be very little penetration. So for those interested in pharmacology, the site of action would have to be the stratum cordium. And that of course would be perfect for sunscreens where people are very actively involved in the research and utilization of nanochemistry for sunscreens. Secondly, it says that pharmacologically, if you want to get it into the epidermis, you probably want a very small nano, near the bottom of the definition, not the top of the size of standard definition given not by nature, but by the, by the chemists. Next, there are two other areas that we learned about, for those of you who want to get into the granularity of what we've learned here. We've learned that within the stratum corneum, there is binding. Now, what do we know about the chemistry of your stratum corneum, this three red blood cell thick membrane that's keeping you alive? What do we know about its composition? Well, for decades, the standard definition for the pharmacologist and the toxicology was given the name by an engineer, now deceased, Alan Michaels. It was called the brick and the mortar, namely bricks and cement model. The bricks are the proteins, the many, many proteins in your stratum corneum, which we're learning more about each year slowly because of the complexity of protein chemistry. And the lipids, the lipids are what surround the stratum corneum cells, the keratinocytes that migrate from the epidermis. So that was the brick and mortar model. Now, the usual theory is that most of the penetration 
is through the lipid rather than through the protein. But there are many aspects of that that remain still not well established. Now, in recent years, we've realized and should have known 50 or 60 years ago that there's a third compartment within the stratum corneum, namely water. So if any of you are above the age of 60, the small audience, you may have noticed that the skin of your legs is often dry, especially in a heated hotel room or in a desert climate. Uh, that is because the skin becomes, it's a very complex biology, dehydrated. So now the stratum corneum is a three membrane compartment. So you now have another compartment to deal with. We said it's the surface is one compartment. The stratum corneum is three compartments. The epidermis, we only know of one compartment at the moment, and the dermis probably has many compartments in it for when we have enough biological good penetration data for really predictive modeling. Now, the next thing we learned from this very simple experiment with the help of the radio label is that there is a significant difference in the binding to the protein and the lipids of these very few chemicals, nanochemicals that we've looked at. So this is another hint that we will eventually be able to use the binding parameter for predictive pharmacology and toxicology. And then another part, which we won't go into, there is a vast literature. Uh, we can provide a reference if you email me, and I'll give the email at the end on the many different types of damaged skin. Namely, how do we predict what will go through the various types of damaged skin from the various types of burns to sunburns to irritant dermatitis, to allergic contact dermatitis, to the various diseases like psoriasis, ringworm infections, and atopic dermatitis. But um, so one of the other things that we have is in these experiments, for those of you who are granular oriented, you'll see we provide some data on what we learned in stripped skin. But what is the stripped strip skin model? Well, the stripped skin model very simply is, was developed in the late 1930s in Germany by the late Hermann Pincus. And he observed if you took the various brands of adhesive tape, clear adhesive tape, like the American brand Scotch tape, you can remove various layers of the stratum corneum. That is the scotch tape method. And one of the uses of the scotch tape method, relatively early, we found out that lo and behold, if you kept on stripping, you could eventually remove the protective barrier. Some people, as few as four or five strips, water comes pouring out. Others, you can use 30 or 40 strips. And now, because we're improving skin biology metrics, we now have a way of measuring each tape strip, how much of the stratum corneum you're using by measuring the amount of protein, just the way you do in using blood levels, uh, of any metric that you use in serum or protein. And if any of you need that reference, if you email me, we will provide it. Now we're coming to the end. Where do I think this fits going forward for the next three to 30 years? Well, for toxicology, I think we're now very much more advanced. I think we do now have 
a much clearer insight and a much clearer tool to study how much goes into the body to allow any toxicologic assays to be more efficient and to decrease the need for animal studies, not stop them, but decrease them and decrease the need for human studies, not stop them, but greatly decrease them. Now, for pharmacologic purposes, I think the stratum cordium is clearly going to be a target. So for those pro clinical problems like sunscreens and skin infections due to, due to fungi that sit largely in the stratum corneum, nanochemistry should be an ideal target to aim at. Now, for very specific uses, where you need to dig even deeper. We have some hints now as to the physical chemical properties of what would get deep into the epidermis. And there we're dealing with another route of transfer into the body. From other experiments, which we won't go into today, uh, the hair follicle diseases like hair loss, like Acne, the sebaceous gland is connected to the hair follicle, like um, deodorants, uh, otherwise the apocrine gland in the armpit and the groin that produce the chemicals that induce a disodor, a disagreeable odor in some people. These are probably all targets which possibly can be dealt with with nanochemistry. So I'm going to leave you now with my email number. If any of you would like to ask, inform me of anything, I'm always delighted to learn. And I have wonderful young colleagues who are equally as happy to learn. The email is just my name, Howard.Mayback, M-A-I-B-A-C-H, at UCSF, that's the abbreviation, University California San Francisco dot edu. So Howard dot Maybach at UCSF dot edu. My cell phone number, which works seven days a week, 364 days a year, but not 65, but we start officially for incoming calls at 7 a.m., not in India, not in Europe, not in South America, in San Francisco time, so would appreciate no calls before 7 a.m.